Senator Biggs, present. Senator Calderon Pitchfork. Senator McDavid. Senator Schmidt. Here. Senator Johnson. Here. Senator Muhammad. Proxy. Proxy. Senator Shakumbi. Oh, Proxy. <laughs> um, Senator Soliman. Yeah. Senator Brandmeyer. Here. Senator Cherry. Here. Senator Moore. Here. Senator Batari? Here. Senator Patel? Here. Senator Schumacher? Here. Senator Rouse? Here. Senator Maltari? Here. Senator Chiwatha? Present. Senator Stiff? Here. Senator Weinzerl? Here. Senator Soma? Here. Senator Bana? Proxy. Senator Bashal? Here. Um, Senator Cook? Here. Senator Nellis? Present. Senator Karki? Here. Senator Prom? Salutations. <laughs> Senator Hoysa? <laughs> Um, Senator Botka? Present. Senator Spursel? Present. Senator Dickey? Present. Uh, President Omar? Present. Vice President Trenny? Present. Awesome. So uh, we'll be starting out with the ele a presentation from the Elections Commission Chair. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Hunter Brains. I'm a junior. I'll be your Chief Elections Commissioner for this year. So, um, yeah, we've worked on the rules from last year. A lot of the changes were made are mostly cosmetic, but I'm going to run through all of them with you guys quickly here. Um, just so everyone's familiar with them, uh, if you need anything from me, I will reach out to uh, John and make sure you guys all get my phone number, email, all that stuff if you guys have questions down the road. Um, but yeah, we'll just get started. I think you guys would have gotten an email, cop uh, copy email to you, but if you want to just look at the screen, we'll run through them quick. Alrighty, so these are the spring election rules for the current 2020 election. Um, if you guys have questions on any point, feel free to just stop me and ask quick. Um, most, like I said, most of the stuff was cosmetic. Um, not a lot of policy changes and things like that. So, any Minnesota State University main K student may seek elected office, provided they satisfy Article 1 of the spring election rules is satisfied. There's a cosmetic change. No person may run for more than one Senate seat and or executive office, president or vice president concurrently. All candidates are required to attend an election rules meeting conducted by the Elections Commission at the beginning of the campaign period to read over these rules and to ask any questions. Candidates unable to attend an election rules meeting must schedule a time to meet with an Elections Commission member, Elections Commission member to discuss the election rules prior to the election, spring election day. Any questions about that? Basically, one of the big changes there was it used to be all candidates and like staff members of the election committee um, were no longer requiring the staff members to do that. Basically, saying if you have people uh, helping you, they're kind of your responsibility and you should know the rules, not that they have. Um, Article 2 filing all candidates must file a candidacy application in order to be active during the campaign period, outlined in Article 4 of these rules, and to appear on the spring election ballot. Candidacy applications shall be available on the Student Government Engage portal. Candidates for Executive office, office, President and Vice President, must file together and no later than two weeks prior to the spring election day. Candidates for all other elected positions must file no later than one week prior to the spring election day. When candidates file, they will receive a copy of the spring election rules and notice of their required attendance at an election rules meeting. The Elections Commission shall compile a voter guide consisting of candidates who choose to submit a personal profile summarizing their qualifications and stances on various issues. The guide shall be available at the Student Government Online Voting Booth, on the Student Government website, and through the Student Government Engage Portal. The Elections Commission will hold a minimum of two election rules meetings prior to the Spring Election Day. If a member appointed to the Elections Commission should decide to run, they must withdraw from the Commission no later than the day candidate candidacy applications are made publicly available. Any member of the Elections Commission remaining past this time shall be ineligible to run in the election. Any write-in candidate that is elected to office must file a candidacy application within 48 hours of being notified of their election by the election, Elections Commission. The Elections Commission will send an email the day following the spring election day to the email address on which on file with the registrar's office. If the election commission is unable to contact the write-in candidate within five business days, the runner-up will take office pursuant to the process of this section of this section of these rules. Any questions about that stuff? Pretty straightforward. I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with all these processes, but we gotta do it. Okay, Article 3, elections publicity. 
The Elections Commission shall distribute posters advertising upcoming elections and candidacy filing procedures. The Elections Commission shall work with the Office of Student Affairs to distribute and all student email advertising upcoming elections and candidacy filing procedures. Article 4, Campaign. <clears throat> campaigning may begin on the date specified by the Elections Commission in the election timeline, but may begin no earlier than the Monday following spring break on the year of the spring election day, provided the requirements within Articles 1 and 2 have been met. All members of a party must have attended a rules meeting before a party may begin campaigning. A person or party is able to request a rules meeting pending approval by the Elections Commission. Campaigning shall be defined as the public distribution or posting of any material or information promoting a candidate slash party or group for office, speaking before an organized group except as allowed in section four of this article or in a public place or forum with the purpose of promoting a candidate slash party or group for office. Any program or activity requesting the vote of a constituent for a specified candidate slash party or group any attempts to discredit an opponent. Encouraging voting in general without specifying a particular candidate slash party or group is not campaigning. Campaign recruitment. Recruitment shall be defined as seeking candidates and or staff for the party or group. Recruitment must be done in a private manner. There is no limit to the number of people that can take part in recruitment. Six, campaign material. Campaign material shall be defined as physical or digital images, statements, and messages by a candidate or endorsing individual or groups for the purposes of campaigning as defined above. Examples of campaign materials include, but are not limited to, literature, posters, advertisements, banners, flyers, printed material, websites, emails, text messages, and social media sites. All campaign materials must be approved and logged by the Elections Commission. All materials must include a disclaimer visible to the naked eye with the word sponsored by to be followed by the name of the individual candidate, party, or group being promoted and the email address of the contact person. Requests for exceptions to this rule that we may be made on a case-by-case -case basis and will be determined by a majority vote of the Elections Commission. Any materials created on behalf of a candidate who is a member or of a party or a group must indicate that candidate's affiliation with that party or group. Poster guidelines. All posters must contain a disclaimer as noted in section 60 and 60 above. Standard posters shall not exceed 11 inches by 17 inches. Large posters may be allowed in specifically designated areas as defined by CSU operations. Two posters for the same candidate or party or group may not be closer than 36 inches. No candidate slash party or anyone representing a campaign slash party shall remove, deface, or post over any other candidate slash party or group's materials. All posters must include the URL for the online election, as well as the spring election date. All printed materials distributed on campus must comply with university graphic standards, which can be found at that website. All posters must be stamped by the Elections Commission or appropriate designee as determined by the Elections Commission chairperson. Within 48 hours of verification of the spring election day results, all candidates must, re must remove all posters. Student newspaper advertisements will follow the same guidelines on posters. A candidate slash party or group that creates a web page and or a social media account to campaign must provide the URL to the Elections Commission. Promotion of the website slash social media account will not be allowed until the campaign period begins. Posts to websites, blogs, and or social media sites do not need individual approval. If any candidate or campaign is going to use the name of any entity, including but not limited to individuals, organizations, departments, or businesses, said campaign or candidate must have written authorization from said entity to do so. This written authorization is to be submitted in the form of the Affidavit of Endorsement provided by the Elections Commission. The Affidavit of Endorsement can be filed electronically on the Student Government Engaged Portal. Announcements to recognize student organizations must include a verbal disclaimer that the candidate is not endorsed by the Student Government or the Student Senate, nor represents the University. The Elections Commission will facilitate official debates between all presidential and vice presidential candidates. These debates shall begin at 12 p.m. on the Wednesday before the spring election day. No campaigning zones. In the Student Government Office and the Student 
in the conduct of student studies business, including student government committees, commissions, or boards, in the memorial in Kyo Suyumatsu Music Libraries, within 30 feet of any polling station on the spring election day, within the student activities office, any office that has requested to be a no campaign zone, Campaigning within the residence hall, Centennial Student Union, and academic buildings must follow those respective zoning guidelines. Any quick questions about those? Article 5, voting. All currently enrolled students shall be eligible to vote online between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. on the spring election day. The Elections Commission will be responsible for staffing a polling station at the Centennial Student Union and University Dining Center for the entirety of the spring election day. As able, the Elections Commission will also staff polling stations at, but not limited to, Margaret R. Presto Residence Community, Julia A. Sears Residence Community, and the Taylor Center. No person involved with the campaign shall staff a polling station. The candidates slash parties or groups and endorsing groups or individuals will be able to table, but must be at least 30 feet from any polling station. No candidate slash party or group or endorsing entity will be allowed to host a polling station. Questions about that? Article 6, Finances. All candidates shall report all contributions and all expenditures related to the campaign for validation and documentation by a member of the Elections Commission prior to being used to campaign. Campaign spending limits. The spending limit for candidates for president or vice president shall be $300 each. The spending limit for candidates for any other office shall be $200. The spending limit for any party or group shall be determined by adding the individual spending limits of party members together, capped at $4,000, whichever is lesser. Any material that indicates a party or group counts against the party or group's spending limit. In-kind in kind gifts, goods, or services provided by outside groups or individuals shall count against campaign spending limits at fair market value. Such gifts, goods, and services must be declared by the campaign and filed with contributions and expenditures. Monetary donations must also be declared and filed. Coupons, certificates, etc. distributed on campus but redeemable at a local business at a later time by non-candidates shall not be considered contributions, contributions for the purpose of campaign finance. Financial reports must contain electronic or physical receipts if a material or service is donated or acquired significantly below the market cost, the candidate shall make a reasonable estimate as to the value of the material or service. That estimate shall be approved by the Elections Commission and shall be recorded against the expenditures and the financial report. Any questions about that? <coughs> cool. Article 7, Violations. The Elections Commission reserves the right through the swearing in of elected candidates to sanction any candidate slash party or group for violation of the spring election rules, the student government constitution, its bylaws, and or university policy due to a campaign violation. The Elections Commission is the sole body authorized to adjudicate alleged violations with exception to university policy. It is the responsibility of the candidates to educate any and all campaign staff or endorsing entities as to the rules set forth by the spring election rules. Candidates will be held responsible for any actions of those assisting with the campaign. Penalties for violations will depend on whether a violation is determined to have occurred. If no violation is found to have occurred, the claim is set aside and no further action will be taken. taken. If a violation is found to have occurred, the severity of the claim must be determined prior to sanctions being applied. Violations should be labeled as either minor or major. The severity of the claim will be determined by a majority vote of the Elections Commission on a case-by-case -case basis. Minor violations should be considered as small offenses but not substantially affecting the outcome of the election. The consequences of a first minor violation should be a written reprimand to the candidate and documentation placed in the election file. At the Elections Commission's discretion, subsequent minor violations may result in a reduction in the campaign spending limit. At the Elections Commission's discretion, Excessive minor violations may be considered a major violation and result in the removal of a candidate's eligibility for election. Major violations should be considered as major offenses substantially affecting the outcome of the election. A major violation may result in removal of eligibility for election. Any questions about Article 7? Cool. Article 8, election results. To be considered an elected candidate, any person must have received at least five votes. 
In the event of a tie between two or more candidates who have received at least five votes for any single elected seat, a runoff election will take place. An additional election will take place one week following the spring election. Voting times will be the same as for the spring election. Spring election rules will remain the same with the exception of the candidates' campaigning materials may remain up until 48 hours after the runoff election. $100 shall be added to the individual candidate's spending limits. In the event an elected candidate chooses, within 48 hours of the election's conclusion, to refuse office, a runner-up, defined as the candidate receiving the next highest number of votes, shall be offered the seat, provided they receive at least five votes. If the runner-up refuses, the next runner-up will be offered the seat. This pattern will continue until there are no viable runners-up, at which point the seat will be declared vacant. The Elections Commission shall review the election results once the election ends. During this time, current voting members of the Elections Commission will be the only people allowed within the student government office seat, with the exception of two election witnesses. These election witnesses will be selected from the non-student body of the campus community to serve as impartial officers <coughs> to ensure the Elections Commission determines the election results fairly and unbiasedly. Article 9 amendments, this document may be amended solely by initiative of the Elections Commission of Elections Commission. Amendments to this document must be made prior to the presentation to the student senate of the year in which the changes are to take effect. And that is it. Are there any questions? Any questions? Singer, thank you so much. <laughs> so next we have Vice President Martinson with the... What? I do have one person to say. Um, so the two large um, rules meetings for the spring haven't quite, uh, the dates haven't been set yet. Uh, people are still building their schedules, so we're not sure when everyone's availability will be. But as soon as everyone gets registered and kind of knows what their upcoming spring will look like, uh, those days will get set and we'll let you guys know um, what exactly those days and times will be. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So now we have Vice President Martinson with a textbook resolution update. Wherever you want. Good afternoon. So uh, I wanted to follow up or I was asked to follow up on uh, the textbook resolution course that the student senate had put forward. Um, first of all, I, I should start this on behalf of the administration by just uh, commending uh, the work of this, this organization. We think uh, it's been a, a great help to us to have that resolution in our back pocket as we go to meetings around campus and, and talk about the student interest uh, in getting this work done. I think also it, it very clearly articulated uh, the why. why. Why is it that we're, we're taking this issue on? Um, so just to give a, a quick update, um, and, and maybe a little bit of history, this, this issue has certainly come up at various times over the years, I know, as recently as last April, there was some concern about how many orders were in at that time. Uh, we worked with the faculty union back then to do about, a, it was about a two week window before the semester ended, uh, and saw quite a bit of movement in that two week period for how many textbook orders came in uh, from faculty. So I think we had reason to believe that, that greater communication would have, would have an effect if we were to, to do that. Um, having said that, so, so I just wanted to give an update on a few of the actions we've taken to date, and then uh, what the results of those actions were, and then of course closing with what our what we'd like to do going forward. Um, the action since since the student resolution uh, was brought to our attention, which I think was at a, a, a meet and confer uh, earlier in the semester that it was it was likely going to happen, and then it subsequently happened. Uh, we took that that resolution or took the information to uh, the various meet and confers around campus, uh, in particular the faculty meet and confer. Uh, and talked to their exec committee about that. Um, we followed up the next month of meeting confer with, with how the data was looking to see if we, what else we needed to do. Um, we did go to a chair's breakfast, so there's uh, about once a month, all of our department chairs come together, all, there's about, um, I don't know if there are, but there's probably no set, um, probably 60 department chairs on campus. And we uh, uh, talked the issue there for quite some time tried to get a sense of what the issue was, why textbook orders might not be coming in as timely as we wanted, and, and sort of brainstorm solutions. We did the same thing with the Council of Deans, and then we met individually with the leadership of the Faculty Association. Uh, the Faculty Association agreed to send out regular emails to their membership to encourage people to get their textbook orders in, explain the process for how to do it, 
uh, offered help if, if they needed it. Um, I should say, you know, from those meetings, uh, we did not get any pushback. No, nobody questioned why we were doing this, what, uh, what the effect on students were financially, uh, what the effects on the bookstore were, and, and so forth. Uh, everyone understood, I think, the goal here. Um, no, I didn't hear a lot of excuses being given either on, on why these things happen. Um, so, what we focused on, and what we're still focusing on, are three different dates that, that we have in mind and, and what our true goal here is. As your resolution mentioned, there is a state law uh, that 45 days from the start of the next term, we need those textbook orders in. There's a little bit of confusion on when the 45 days start, but just to give you an example, uh, November 29th would actually be the state law drop dead date uh, for this for, for spring term. That's different than the bookstore deadline. The bookstore has a deadline of October 16th, and rightfully so, November 29th is actually pretty late. We would like to get those in earlier. In an ideal universe, our schedule goes live October 4th of that, or this year. Anyway. Um, we would actually like our textbook orders to be known at that time. If you remember the, uh, the US code that you all cited, uh, highly encourage, it doesn't mandate, but it highly encourages at the time your schedule goes live to have your textbook information linked to from your registration site and that information available to students. Um, that would be a very difficult deadline to make for a lot of reasons, uh, but it is something that we should strive for to look at how quickly we can have, uh, and certainly for standard courses where the, the, the book is very much the same year to year, especially when we have multiple sections of the same class, like the big classes of anatomy and so forth, um, that would seem more possible. Um, that U.S. Code also highly encouraged us to meet whatever whatever bookstore deadlines were, were established. So that, those are the actions we took more or less. The, the results have been very encouraging. We initially had only about 30% of orders in uh, for this fall, for the, for the spring semester by that uh, bookstore deadline. Since that time, we sent out uh, some communications. We took a quick pulse uh, with the bookstore on October 27th. Uh, we were up to 77% of all orders were in. And then by November 2nd, just a week later, through additional communication, we were up to 86%. Uh, as of today, we are now at 94%. Um, and mostly, I, don't, I believe every college is at least at 90%. Uh, College of Business is actually 99, so they're winning the race, I guess, if you will, at this point. Uh, you want to encourage somebody, Arts and Humanities is flagging a little, but we'll, we'll work on it. Um, there could be good reasons why some fields are easier than others. So. But um, anyway, so that's where we are. The, the bookstore, the, the Janine, the, the bookstore I talked to today, uh, said that was those are very good numbers for her, better than, than she's probably experienced before. So I think, again, kudos to this group. Um, for sort of kicking us in the hands into us. <laughs> um, going forward, what would we like to do? So, so out of those discussions, you know, the question was, we can't just let this drop every semester and then try to play catch up. Uh, we do think that our communication plan, uh, we have some ideas for how to, how to keep that moving forward. Very similar to a plan we installed a couple years ago with uh, late grades being submitted. I don't know if this group was familiar with that, but we used to have a problem with grades not being submitted in time to meet actually the federal uh, guideline that, that, that actually has strong ramifications for students getting financial aid. So we've implemented, implemented a new uh, system there where we don't have those lingering incomplete grades and other things uh, sitting out there. So uh, we think a similar plan here could work through our deans. Uh, at the department chair's breakfast, the chairs were very open to being more involved, getting uh, updated spreadsheets on their departments from the bookstore and then willing to follow up or have, in some cases, uh, department administrative assistants already do this in some departments. Uh, the bookstore uh, actually seemed to be very comfortable following up directly with more and more faculty, so we, we talked about how to do that. Um, we did talk briefly with the deans about, you know, we understand this can happen here or there, but what about your repeat offenders, the people who constantly are not getting their orders in? So uh, sort of having a more, a little more of a stick than a carrot in that case, uh, to when you do our normal performance evaluation of why you're not getting this done. Um, there were some other issues that came out in this conversation. Obviously, we want to encourage the move to open resources for a variety of reasons, um, but also having um, 
ways to communicate that through the bookstore. When your professors are picking alternative resources than a textbook, can that information be communicated through the, the bookstore site as well? Um, some faculty, for example, didn't submit their textbook requests because they didn't have one to submit, but so they didn't think they had to, but the bookstore likes that information anyway to say no textbook required or alternative. Um, so, so things like that. Um, some of the issues that do come up when we hire adjuncts or make new hires, obviously we don't want to wait on them to pick the book. So we talked about having departments go ahead and select the book for them. Um, and then lastly, I'll mention, uh, encourage, we, we talked to some departments about, um, you know, especially for, for large, large classes where we offer multiple sections across many instructors. Um, a lot of those departments are picking a common book. So there's no reason that information couldn't be communicated sooner. There's also the idea of those that aren't using a common book, why not? It, you know, should, should we be encouraging that a little more? Um, or common um, uh, uh, open resources in that case. So I know there's a few larger classes that are looking at using a common department of chosen uh, open resource there. So uh, that's, I think, most of the information I have. I'm certainly willing to stand for questions depending on how your schedule works. Um, are there any questions? Any questions? Well, oh, uh, Vice President Cherney. I just want to say quickly, because um, I know a lot of us care about the issue, thank you so much for all the work the administration is doing. Um, and we hope to, by you know, next semester, keep hearing these updates, because I think they're really good. I'll call for questions. Willing to be held accountable for that because my worry is that we'll do this once and then we'll always wait until we hear it's not going well and then play catch up. So I, I want to make sure that we have something that, you know, what I want to see is by those actual deadlines, we actually start seeing movement with the, the numbers going on. Well, thank you so much for coming in and all the work you're doing. So next we have a presentation from Provost Wells. Institutes that would, and the part in green kind of gets to the why. 
raise our academic distinctiveness and profile. You know, when you get your degree from here, and you know I said when, not here, uh, you want it to be well respected, like, oh, Mankato, or, oh, that program. So we continually want, we want your degree and your institution to be really recognized for being distinct. And that's also helpful in us uh, attracting new students to the university. Um, Vice President Jones has shared in other venues how the number of high school graduates is going down in Minnesota because the job market is currently good, fewer are going to college, and then more Minnesota high school graduates are leaving the state than are coming into us from other states. So how do we position ourselves as a university to keep more Minnesota high school graduates in Minnesota and to continually attract new students from not only from the United States throughout the world? And sometimes when students don't come here or they leave us, we have those programs all along, but they, they were hidden. We have some fantastic programs, but sometimes the way we're organized, uh, students don't find them as easily. Um, how can our organizational structures help us to continually create new programs that will serve you in the lifetimes in which you're going to live, into the future? What's out there that we're not even thinking about, and how do we uh, create new programs of interest and relevance uh, to you? Uh, how do we position our organization that we can attract new caliber faculty? How do we bring our existing faculty together to work in new and distinct ways? How do we create new partnerships? If any of you thinks the legislature all of a sudden can give us stops more money, um, that's probably not a reality. And we certainly want to be uh, as modest as we can with tuition increases. So how do we work with corporate sponsors, donors to bring new money into the university? And how come sometimes our organizational designs help us in that regard? Or sometimes our organizational signs are we missing opportunities? Um, and so those are some of the reasons why. Um, and like I said, over the last two years, we've had a lot of important developments. And those are highlighted in one of the documents. Uh, we're doing this in the frame of on the heels of our academic master planning that we began in 2013-14. We said we can't be all things to all people. Where is it we want to be really solid and good? And what are some areas of the university across colleges, across departments, that we really want to be known for our distinctiveness, that we're special, we're good, we're unique? And these were some of the broad areas that came out of our academic master plan. And some of the areas we've had a lot of success in. We've had a lot of developments around ag in the last few years, uh, communication and arts and so forth. Um, in 2016, uh, the university, on the heels of our last Higher Learning Commission accreditation, uh, the university, President Davenport, um, announced new strategic directions for the university. And then that entire year, we, for each of these six strategic directions, we had a task force that had students on them and employees from across the university that developed specific goals and objectives under these. What you might see is a lot of the reasons we've talked about why to look at new organization designs help students succeed. How do we elevate faculty? How do we elevate our programs? How do we have impact? But on there, you see new organizational designs. So while some of the big conversations seem like maybe they fall in our lap suddenly, it's work that we've been building for the last couple of years. As one example, uh, is, um, um, so where are we in this process? Um, again, we've had a lot of conversations about how we given some framework to moving it forward in a bigger and more purposeful way this year. At the October 31st Faculty Association meet and confer, we introduced a process and timeline. We introduced that to student government October 31st, we did the faculty tent. The month of October, our, our uh, bargaining units had different meeting dates. Also at the October 31st, we presented some different models in a phase one, a phase two, and a phase three approach. Um, back in 2013-14, our planning submeet, again, which you have representation on, developed definitions. What's a school? What's a center? Um, so it's time to refresh those definitions. If we're developing new things, we want to know what we're developing. So what's a, what makes a school a school? What makes an institute an institute? What makes a center a center? So right now we're in the process of fine-tuning of those definitions. Right now we're in the midst of uh, open forums. We've had three so far. We have two more scheduled. Uh, and those will be 
in our telepresence room, so even students and employees in the Dyna and Normandale Long Island Range can participate. Uh, there's a number of places you see I've been invited here that we've been invited to talk about these and others are emerging. And of course we have a website where all of the information is provided and importantly where you can provide input. What do you like about the concepts? What ideas can you offer to improve the concepts? What are concerns? What are challenges about those? So, so Stone Dream says if we're talking about new ones, what do we have now? Uh, at present, depending how you count them, we have seven or eight colleges. We have the six academic colleges. Hopefully you know which one you're in. Uh, Arts and Humanities, uh, Allied Health and Nursing, Business, Education, Science, Engineering, Technology, and Social and Behavioral Sciences. Those are what we call our academic colleges, where faculty are, programs are, and the majors you're in or in one of those colleges. We have the Graduate College, which really provides uh, an infrastructure and support for our graduate programs. We also have our College of Center Learning. At present, we have two schools. The School of Communication, which was launched last year. It's nested within the College of Arts and Humanities. We've had the School of Nursing since 1953. We have four institutes, um, three laboratories, and I'm not talking about rooms where you have beakers and hoods and Bunsen burners. I'm talking about entities that would be research entities. Uh, 30 plus centers on campus, and as I said, right now we're updating and refining those. And on the website is a list of what all of those are. And there's just some examples there of some of the things that we have from the Water Resources Center to the Center for Essence and Teaching and Learning, the Glenn Taylor Institute for Family and Societal Learning. Again, we have lots of these. Uh, this is just you know some slides from when we introduced the School of Communication last year. So, and these are just snippets or highlights of some of the developments that have occurred over the last few years. So where are we going? Phase one. Uh, what is proposed and what uh, we're looking at at this point in time are four concepts. And we very much want uh, your input and appreciate some of the good discussion we had at the last meet and confer. One is uh, bringing together all of the many developments we've had over the last actually four to five years around agriculture and a launching a baby step, a college of applied agriculture that could bring, uh, at present, many people don't realize we have at least five programs. We have a new BS in agricultural sciences. We have a BS in food science technology. We have a BS in um, uh, dietetics. Many, most of our graduates in civil engineering go to work for ag firms, many of our accounting graduates. Uh, we have an ag business and food innovation minor nested in the colleges, but how could we bring them together so you, prospective students, know about them and bring faculty and staff together to create new curricula. Uh, so that would be a structure probably more like a graduate college where it's like a hub. Another concept would be a, um, uh, a school of global education. We have a dean of global education and three centers that are largely designed to provide services to our international students, though one of those also provides uh, for study abroad and away. So if you wanted to go to the New York City trip in January, that's within that area. However, across our six academic colleges, across all six colleges, we have academic programs that have the name Global, Cultural, International in them. And Oftentimes, people get in their silos, so this again could be a place where students can learn about those programs, where faculty teaching those programs can come together, and again, when you get in the room and talk, good things happen. Another concept would be, uh, as you've seen, we've had some uh, a Polytech Institute or a hub around that. This is an opportunity for our university to be distinctive. In the past, sometimes our university has been expected to be the same on like WM universities in the system. But the chancellor says, you know, we're, we're really a powerhouse in a lot of the areas around technology. So how can we be a leader in the system in the state? Across the system, uh, across the community colleges, the most commonly conferred associate degree is the Associate of Applied Science, as opposed to the AA or the AS degree. The Associate of Applied Science is usually in some technology area, and we kind of have a gap in the system where those students can go to earn a Bachelor of Applied Science or other bachelor's degrees. So it can be an opportunity for students who are getting two-year degrees, 
we can provide expertise, experience, it could also be a place where uh, some of the emerging industries in our region of Minnesota are around medical device manufacturing and cybersecurity. So it can be a hub again for where industries that have this huge need can come together with students and faculty and move things forward. The fourth concept is we continually um, uh, reshape our envision our future of the library and other units that are housed in the library but currently report other places like accessibility resources or how do we connect those together so those are four phase one concepts that we're seeking feedback on uh, ideas for improvements concerns um, what would we move forward now what might need a little more discussion to potentially start the first steps of implementation the spring semester. Uh, that's just the thing about our... Uh, in 2015, we were designated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture as a non-land-grant college of agriculture. Now, who wants to be a non-anything? It's hard to explain to students and to other people. In Minnesota, we have a land-grant university, which is U of M. They have a niche in certain kinds of ag and research, but there's a gap that they don't fill. There's 60,000 um, jobs in agriculture in the United States each year, and only about 30,000 college graduates to fill those. There's a unique niche for us there. So phase two, uh, this would be something, we're beginning the conversations now, but they'll continue in the spring semester. As a university, big questions we can ask, what's the right number of colleges that we should have? Should our colleges have long names after academic disciplines, or should they have shorter names that more reflect what you'll do when you go out into the world? So maybe an example, social and behavioral sciences versus democracy and social change, um, or arts and humanities versus arts, media, and entertainment. These are the kinds of conversations we can have. How many colleges we have, so how should they be organized, one of the points that was raised um, in student government was um, we have a college of education, but we have 17 education programs in other colleges that are harder for students to find. And sometimes they're named chemistry teaching, biology education. Where do our organizational designs working to help you? And where are organizational designs barriers uh, for, for you having success in your life. So how many should we have? How should they be organized? How should they be named uh, to be a university of the future, to attract new students? And then um, we have conversations to decide, we have three, we have nine, whatever that number, whatever they might be named. Um, phase three would be over the course of maybe the next one to three years, departments might say, you know, I've been in this college but based upon what we're doing today and into the future, we might find as a department a better fit in another college. Or how do we work together across those areas? Um, so um, let me pause there. That was a lot of information uh, to see what questions you have. Uh, these are the slides from the open forum, so we're not going to have panel discussions here now, but we can ask your questions. And again, you're more than welcome to um, uh, come to the open forums, or if you would like some open forums specifically for students, we can get those scheduled as well. So let me see what questions you have. Hey, are there any questions? Sorry. I'm not to um, any questions? Um, President Omar. Um, I just say that we can request open forum for students. Is that not already in the works? Yep. It is? Okay. Uh, yes, you can absolutely request that. Okay. We put five out there to get started, but we can certainly add more. Yeah, um, I would yeah. appreciate that, as well as I know that there's an all-faculty email sent regarding the new um, institutes, colleges, and schools. Like, if we could get one sent to all students as well. Yeah. Or we can do it on our end as well. Absolutely. Are we able but to? But we'd be happy to work with you to okay. schedule additional forums and locations and times that would be uh, terrific for students. Absolutely. Any other questions? Any other questions? Seeing that, thank you so much for coming. So now we have the RHA president, President Prom and Senator. Salutations, one and all, young and old, prepared to be amazed. No, I'm kidding. I just stole a theme off of PowerPoint and used that. So.
while I'm getting set up, how is everyone today? Fantastic. Yeah. Wonderful. What? You're doing bad? I'm sorry. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. So, RHA room and board rate. So, um, you all kind of know a little bit about this, how it kind of works is RHA votes on a bunch of stuff on what they want to see improvements in the res halls or the dining center and such, and then um, I take the results of that and come and speak to all y'all's wonderful, gorgeous people. So, we just voted last Monday, so woo! So the first thing we voted on was the phone charging station. So um, there were two different options for this. Well, first of all, what is a phone charging station? I'm so glad you asked that, thank you. So um, a phone charging station is um, those big wonderful things you see, um, especially in the Centennial Student Union, where um, you can go and plug in your phone and have a pin and lock it in there, and then when it's all charged up and ready to go, you can go and enter your pin again and have one of those. So um, that was on the ballot. There were two options. One, to have one of those in the dining center, and the other option was to have one of those in every single residence hall lobby. So they could vote for either of them, both of them, or just uno of them. So. What are the results? No to the charging station in the dining center, so they voted that down. And no to the other one as well. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's okay, it's what the res people in the res halls want. Um, so yeah, we will not be getting any new chargers, so wonderful. So, RHA promo item. What's the RHA promo item? Who here has lived in the residence halls at some point? Woo! Okay, have, do you remember that amazing water bottle or lanyard or something like that you got? Wonderful. I, we even have a model right here. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't know Vanna White guest starred here. Okay, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, RHA promo item. We, um, as the Residence Hall Association, try and put a new thingamabobber, if you will, in each room for each of our residents. So, for example, last year we did one of those gorgeous water bottles for every resident. Um, so, those water bottles cost roughly about $3.50 a piece to me. So um, we gave the voters um, two options, I believe. Um, $4 to just have the water bottles once more, or $6 to get an upgrade kind of thing. So we would look at different things or different promo items, stuff like that. What was the result? They love the water bottles, so they get more water bottles. <laughs> so um, they voted $4 for that, so yay. Desk supply upgrades. So um, for those of you who don't know, every single front desk in the residence halls um, allow you to check out items if you are a member of the residence halls. So um, if I want to make the college delicacy of ramen noodles, um, I would go down and I can check out a pot slash pan <laughs> and make my ramen in there and then just clean it and then return it at no cost. Woo! So yeah, it's an amazing deal. It's incredible. But so um, obviously sometimes those pots and pans get damaged or there are people like me who don't know how to cook and um, like they could potentially damage a pot or a pan. Um, so we need some upgrades or some replacements. So um, that was on the ballot as well to give some money for replacements at the front desks. They give us a whopping $1. So, um, no, $1 per student. So obviously it will add up a lot and we'll be able to get a lot more wonderful things. Um, actually, I believe the Presque Residence community just got a blender, so. Ooh. That's, I know. 
so um, with this money, we will be buying newer stuff like that, as well as replacing older things. So, what is the overall increase in residence hall price? Five dollars a student. I know it's a lot to handle. It's a lot, like five dollars. Holy crap, that could be like a Chick-fil-A deal. But we are improving the residence halls so incredibly much. And you get a water bottle if you stay in the residence halls, which is amazing. Um, so with that, um, I would like to stand for questions. Um, are there any questions? For, is it, um, Dean Janey. If I can distribute a sheet that shows this added back in, I'll refer you to column A and column J. Would you run that down to the other end? You got it. Have a <coughs> column A is this year. Let me pass that down. And column J is proposed to us. <coughs> Um, we had about 42 people vote. So, um, yeah, it was a really, really good turnout this year. We're very happy about that. Thank you. Of course. Any other questions? Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your time. So, we are done with presentations. Is there anyone here for open forum? Ellie? I figured. <laughs> we have one more pilot program coming up this Friday, 2 to 5 p.m. in Minneapolis State Park. We'll meet from Auto Rec. We'll have free vans going out, five bucks. Transportation included. I'll have cookies and cocoa ready for you if you want to come out and join us. Thanks. Thank you. Since we're talking about dance, our dance class is today at. Um, I was at a weekly sports film progress meeting this afternoon and still on target for potentially a December 6th substantial completion date. But what that could possibly mean, and we've got a window hopefully with weather between Friday and this coming Monday, early Monday, at Monday afternoon, we could see a dome being inflated. So Monday, November 25th, potentially sometime early afternoon. Then I mentioned in the past as well, there's still a couple weeks worth of work to do to get it ready, put up lights and nets, finish the support building. There's some things, other things that need to go on, but if you want to potentially see a dome being inflated, right now we're on target for this coming Monday. So, thank you. Any questions about it? Yeah? Cool. Yep. Is there anyone else here for open forum? Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, um, we'll move on to the approval of the consent agenda. Is there any dissent to the approval of the consent agenda? Any dissent? Seeing none, the consent agenda is approved. Um, we'll now move into officer reports. President Omar? Um, I just have a few quick updates. I wanted to remind those senators who are going to Students United Conference, we will be meeting at 3 p.m. on Friday in the Student Government Office where you guys will be receiving your training, and then we'll head out on the road at 5 p.m. Um, and we are expecting to be back Sunday at 8.30 a.m. We're leaving mm -hmm. Winona at 8.30 a.m. Yeah, sorry, not, yes. <laughs> um, secondly, we do have me confer coming up on Thursday, December 5th from 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. I will pass around the sign-up sheet for those of you who are interested. Um, and then Campus Recreation Advisory, um, Fee Advisory Committee is still looking for a senator. Sounds good, it's still looking for a senator to Sit in on the committee. Um, if you guys are interested, please let me know. You guys can hang out with Todd, which is amazing. And so see me afterwards. And then lastly, since November is coming to an end, we do have a Senator of the Month. And this Senator has done an outstanding job leading in her committee and taking the lead on Mav Life. 
when it comes to academics. So our Senator of the Month will be Senator Shoemaker from FCS. Vice President Trenny. The only update I have is that um, we have sitting university meeting on Thursday, so it's tomorrow, I think at 5. If anyone wants to come with, let me know. We can uh, go and have fun at South Central. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, with that, I yield. Are there any questions for Vice President Trenny? Okay, seeing now we'll move into my officer report. Um, the officer hours are due this week, so make sure you guys submit those on Engage. This is the last time you'll be submitting them for this semester because you guys have Thanksgiving break, and then it's dead week, and then it's final. So submit them this week, and you guys are done for the semester. But I still recommend you do your office hours, especially the one that's announced. But you don't need to turn them in. Um, besides that, the dean of the day is Dean Budge from CSET. Ooh. Thank you for being here with us today. And with that, I yield. Are there any questions oh also there's no meeting next week because we don't have school that Wednesday I won't be here you guys shouldn't be here either so don't show up please um, are there any questions for me okay seeing them we'll move into Senator report Senator Nellis within our program at college is that we're dropping our um, BA and in communication sciences and disorders um, just because it doesn't meet um, and is not consistent with the policy that we have in place. Um, so that was approved by the dean and is now moving on to the provost. So that would be something that's changing. And then something exciting, if you didn't know, our college offers four levels of ASL. I'm currently on a third level, woohoo. So right now we um, are working on an ASL minor and renaming that class because it's called sign language and it's technically American Sign Language. So that's just um, something else. And then we're reorganizing the classes. So if you're not familiar, all the classes are 200 level. So it goes 205 and then ends with 208. Um, and if you don't know about sign language, that um, is not a correct depiction of the courses um, and their level of um, skill and ability. So that's something that uh, we also have a couple faculty members working on. So those are hopefully going to get um, put into different levels so they reflect um, the work that needs to be put in. Um, and so hopefully we can get the minor rolling and so students can uh, take advantage of it. And then diversity. So if you didn't know, 94% of speech pathologists are Caucasian. Um, and so Megan, the department head of communication sciences and disorders, has come up with a program called Diversity Cohorts. So we're partnering with Minneapolis Public Schools and we're admitting people of color into our master's program. So we can decrease that 94%. Um, and there's more to come on that. Uh, it's uh, early and I'm gonna meet with Megan about that so I can get back to you um, on that. And then there are four core classes that you need to take to be admitted into the major. Um, and they're only offered uh, in the fall and the summer. And Dean Rutherford said that um, just because we offer summer classes does not mean we should require them 
or that you should plan around them for your major. So she is going to take that into her hands and hopefully they can be offered in the fall and spring. So I can graduate. <laughs> That's all I yield. Awesome. President Omar? Uh, so the 94% you're talking about getting more students of color, do you know what incentives, incentives they'll be using? Scholarships? Um, or, you know. I know T. Rutherford mentioned a couple of things, but I'm just not sure on the specifics, so I don't want to say anything, but I believe there are, it's a scholarship opportunity. I believe that's what's happening with that. But I can confirm and get back to you, just so you have that right information. Awesome. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Senator McDavid. Hey everybody. Um, kind of, I wasn't at the meeting with Gretchen here, sadly, so she kind of filled you guys in on the broad stuff for the College Valley Health and Nursing. Uh, for me, I've been working more with FCS because that's kind of where I live and breathe. Um, so right now, if you guys don't know the major too much, um, FCS is it's really broad. So the issue we're having right now is the common bell system when it comes up or the common schedule, uh, a lot of the professors that are really specific in one area, like dietetics instead of maybe financing within FCS, uh, are starting to teach courses that are actually pretty, pretty not like, they're not working out for that uh, professor specifically. So I've been trying to work with the, uh, the dean of our college, trying to figure out how to go about fixing that schedule and to make sure that the right professors are teaching the right courses and not just make sure that there's a body filling the seat. Um, so we've got a few more meetings coming up in the next two weeks. Hopefully we'll figure that one out. Uh, it's kind of harebrained because there's a lot of emotions involved with it right now just because it would be tough for some people to work around their schedules. Um, but it's really detrimental when you have somebody teaching a course that they are technically qualified to be teaching but not really knowing what specifics need to be taught. Um, besides that, uh, we're working on a mentor program for dietetics right now. It's kind of a trial, um, but we'd like to expand it to the entire FCS major. Uh, the idea would be to get one to maybe three uh, students uh, that are freshly admitted into the programs that they're looking to be admitted into. Um, and then working with a senior or an upper level junior to kind of mentor them through the program and the courses that they've already taken. Uh, the big step you'd have to take with that is finding a way to incentivize uh, the busy seniors that really don't want to take on that task. Um, so we're kind of trying to come up with ideas on how to go about incentivizing them. Um, besides that, there's some talks of dietetics being moved around with the new uh, changes that we were just talking about earlier. So that's something else I'm kind of focused on, and that's really about it. Any questions? Are there any questions? Any questions? Seeing, oh, yep, go ahead. So for um, family consumer science, is it just, are you more focused on dietetics, or? Me personally, yeah. it's, it's pretty broad. I mean, it goes anywhere from like the FCS teachers you had in uh, high school. Uh, down to like food science, dietetics, so it's kind of all over the board. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. <laughs> and last, we have Senator Cherry. Survey. 
So I went ahead and made a survey and sent it out to everyone. We had 19 responses in total. Um, most of them were good. We had a few suggestions, though. Um, one on maybe having it earlier in the semester since those grad school application deadlines are approaching pretty quickly. Um, another being more diversification in majors. Specifically, we had comments about more STEM fields um, and then speech pathology and psychology. So that could be something to look into if we do this again. And then um, another comment on making it less GA focused, so a graduate assistant focused. Um, that's kind of how I knew to reach out to people just because I have a DA, so it was like a little biased in that sense. So we'll make sure to have more like working professionals on the panel the next time we do it. But overall, it went pretty well. So that was exciting. Um, and then Senator Brandmeyer talked about the Grad Student Alliance that we formed. Um, we got approved. The RSO is up and running. Um, we're going to have a prelim preliminary meeting um, when we get back from Thanksgiving just to make some plans for the following semester. Get some ideas from other grad students, see like, what they want to see um, in the organization. And then tomorrow I'm attending a graduate enrollment management meeting. Um, and then Senator Brandmeier and I will be attending a GCAP meeting on December 5th. So once we go to those things and get some more information from the Dean of Graduate Studies, we'll have more to talk about this. Awesome. Right. Are there any questions? Questions? See you. Thank you. So now we will be moving into old business. So this is from the start of the month. So rack your brains, guys. <laughs> Um, and we tabled it to this meeting to have the final discussion. So the three motions that are currently under old business, we will be voting on today, unless it's tabled. Please don't table it into next semester. I might just turn that down. Um, so make sure we're voting on those today. Make sure you guys have good discussion. I'm going to turn it over to um, Vice President Trenny to speak about some of the changes. And they all got passed out to you guys under your agendas. Um, and the changes, are underlined in red, or they are in red. So, um, Vice President Trenning to speak about the Library Bookstore Advisory Committee condensement. Yes, so the um, Constitution Commission met last Friday, um, early afternoon, and they have the power to, well, they have to, they write all the Constitution amendments for voters, and they can um, help initiate uh, bylaw changes. And so they took our bylaw, the one that was being discussed at Senate, um, took it and then made uh, corrections. Mostly, most of them are friendly. As in, if you go to page two, there's page numbers on the back. Um, it was changed in um, subsection B three. It was changed to staff, um, just because IFO, IFO members are faculty members in library, so there are staff members, which was in the original intent. Um, and also, it was changed from dean of library services to dean of library and learning. That's a new name. Didn't know that. Um, <laughs> Um, and then subsection C, again, it was just changed, um, library learning. And then the last time, um, this came up in discussion last time, the, in subsection D, it was added in about the meetings where one would be about the electing the chair, having talking about the bookstore and the library as a whole. And then each other meeting after that would be um, separated between the two um, stakeholders. One would be about the library, the other would be about the bookstore. Um, and then. Um, it was brought to my attention to why three, three is just a minimum. It can go more than three, which we love. Um, that was brought up by the Dean of Library and Learning. He would see more than three meetings if this was passed. Um, subsection F was renamed, or just renumbered to F, and then put in program, again, and learning. And then this came from President Omar. Um, she wants the subcommittee and the committee as a whole, when they do, when they purchase textbooks, um, for the pro the member textbook reserve program that we are at least consulted, as in they come and tell us, hey, this is what we're going to spend the money with. Uh, the reason why is because it's like thirty thousand dollars a year, and we just don't want that to go amok. So it's just we want to be consulted about it and have kind of some communication between that committee and us as a center. Um, and then page three is the last page. This is where most of the changes were made. Um, this came from President Omar and agreed upon by the commission and all stakeholders that the chair of the subcommittee is appointed by the student government president, approved by the Senate, the chair shall lead the meetings, called means order, and will actually work with the manager of the bookstore and all stakeholders to manage the Maverick Textbook Reserve Program. And then it says the subcommittee has to meet at least twice a semester and for the meeting should be called by the chair. Um, and then the membership was changed where it was three, now it is three students, one of which has to be, a, no, well, one of which is the appointed chair. Uh, appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. That way it's three students, one's the chair, so two other students that are not the chair. And then again, change from faculty, library faculty to library staff. And then subsection G, um, 
the library and bookstore advisory committee and any of its subcommittees or duties shall be shall when scheduling meetings consider student schedules and try to the best of their ability to find the most available time for all parties to meet. This was brought up again at Senate that this should be the model of all committees, not the exception. Um, I will be making a bylaw change or a legislation next semester to have it so that any Senate related committee, again, this isn't like a meet confer, not subcommittee confers, it's just in general, any committee that reports to the Senate shall, when meeting, take into account student senator schedules and students in general, just because we don't want a committee to meet when no one's available and it's just the administrators. It's kind of nullifies the point of the Senate committee. Um, and that's that's the changes from the commission. Otherwise, everything else has stayed the same. Oh, one update. I met with Dean uh, of Library and Learning, Chris Corley. He is also on board with giving this a try. Uh, the manager of the bookstore is also in favor of giving this a try, so all stakeholders besides us have had a look at this and have formally agreed to help work and solve this issue by um, taking this condensed legislation. Are there any questions for Vice President Trenny? So if you have any questions about the bylaw in general, you should ask them now so that we're not confused in discussion. <coughs> questions? Senator Rouse? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I guess what is the reasoning for uh, making this the chair of the Maverick textbook reserve would be selected by the president and not within like the committee it's, itself? Um, so that, do we need to Okay, so just because it's a student government program, and also we want the chair to take control of it right away from the beginning of the school year. If we wait for the committee to be, we anticipate usually typically two weeks for appointments to be made, so it's two Senate meetings. So that's technically almost three weeks. And then it's got they gotta find a time to meet and then elect that chair. Whereas if we just appoint them, they'll be able to start meeting right away. I see. That's the discussion. Do you have anything to add, President Omar? Um, also, you can start getting to work during the summer, get those books ready to go. I will say, so in past years, um, the uh, student government presidents have made appointments at the end of the year. We didn't do it this year, but that's not saying that we had, you can appoint it at the end of this year and be like, we can make the coordinator appointments at the end of this year so that we know who that person is and they can be in contact. So, so. Are there any other questions for Vice President Trenny? Any other questions? Yep. So this is actually just a friendly amendment. Anything with learning on it attached to the library and learning should be capitalized. I it was late last night. I'm sorry. <laughs> just that's a friendly amendment. Okay. So we'll now be moving into the discussion. Just a reminder: if you have questions for a certain person, it needs to go through me. So you'll just say point of clarification, ask the question, and tell me who it's for, and then I'll yield to them. Um, other than that, make sure we're not getting too repetitive with what we're saying. Um, snaps work great, but if you do have an opinion that has not been heard yet, make sure you speak it so you can speak on behalf of your constituents. So we will now open the floor for discussion on this amendment. Is there any points of discussion? 